Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Come on, y'all. Hallelujah. Mm. Come on and stop. Come on and stop. Your feet are with me. He is good. Your feet are with me. Come on, stop him. Your feet are with me. Come and stomp your feet. Singing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do your dance. Come on and do your dance with me. Come on and do your dance with me. Come and do your dance. Do your dance with me. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. He's so worthy. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm-hmm. We're going to lift them. Yeah, come on and lift your hands with me. Come on and lift your hands with me. Yeah, come on and lift them. Lift them high for Jesus. Well, uh, hallelujah. Well, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. He's so well. Yes, he is. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, Come on and praise. Come on and praise the Lord with me. Come on and praise the Lord with me. Sing it like you mean it. The Lord with me. Come on and praise the Lord with me. Hallelujah. Mm. Well, uh, hallelujah. He's so worthy. Yeah, he's so worthy. A hallelujah. Mm. My God, my God, my Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 One more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, Pastor Bonner. I want you to lift your hands with me. Well, come on and lift your hands with me. He's so worthy. Yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. 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 
I thank you for letting me hallelujah. I my voice, clap my hands, don't my hallelujah. Amen. Remain standing as we prepare to sing our morning hymn, I am thine, O Lord. I've heard thy voice and it told thy love to me, but I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spin when I kneel in prayer and with thee my God I commune as friend with friend there are depths of love that I cannot know Till I cross the narrow sea There are heights of joy That I may not reach Till I rest in peace with thee Oh, draw me nearer Nearer, blessed Lord To thy cross where thou as thy draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy house where thou. As thine, draw me nearer, <clears throat> nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Let us say amen. amen. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, and verses 25, 26, and 27. 
They are printed in your bulletin and also I think they're on the screen. So we have no excuse for being able to read it together. Let us begin. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So in if the reading of God's precious word, you may be seated. This morning, we are going to um, insert in our morning worship a prayer. Then after that prayer, the choir will come with a prayer chant. And we are uh, feeling the spirit of God and to see in terms of how the Lord will bless us as we go forth in this area and in this part of our worship moment. As the musicians play softly, let us bow together our heads for a prayer of consecration and dedication. Precious Father, we come at your bidding, by your permission. We can't brag about anything because we have been saved by your grace and we have been kept by your mercy. So in the spirit and in the heart of David in Psalm 51, Lord, create in all of us this morning a clean heart. Renew the right spirit. And above all, Lord, refill us with your joy. And like that old Negro spiritual said, if you find anything in us that shouldn't be, take it out, Lord. Straighten us. Prepare us, dear God, for your presence, your power. Speak to us, Lord, for thy servants heareth. We bow now in spirit and in mind. Help us this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask it all now in the mighty and awesome name of God the Father for his glory, Jesus Christ for his majesty, the Holy Spirit for his teaching, and the church for your edification. We pray, and may we all say together, Amen. Amen. Our Father, Our 
hallowed your kingdom come your will now as it all has always been in heaven what do we need father and forgive us cleanse us as we have already forgiven others in our lives and then father lead us not into temptation but deliver us by your power and because of this thine is the power and the glory forever to all ages Amen Amen
he will. Do you know he will? Well, I'm standing on the word of God. Yeah, I'm standing on on the word of God. He said all things work together for for the good of them, the good of them who love the Lord. He said he will. He said he will. He said he will. He said he will. I'll be with you till the ends of the earth. Yeah, he said he will. Yeah, he said he will. That's why I know 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 he will. Because he said he will. So I know he will. Said he said he will. So I know he will. I'm standing on the promises of God. I'm standing on the promises of God. He's a firm foundation. A firm foundation cannot be shaken. Cannot be shaken. He said he will. He said he will. He said he will. He said he will, so I know he will. I know he will. I know he will. Supply. No, he will. I know he will. I know he will. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! I know he will. 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 I said he will. He said he will supply. He said he will. He said he will. He said he will. Supply, so I will wait on him. Yeah, I will wait on him. So I will wait on him. So I will wait on him. Yeah, he said he will. So I believe he will. I believe he will. Supply, I know he will. He told me he will. He told me he will. He told me he will. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. No more tears. No more sorrow. No more sickness. Hope for tomorrow. Hope for tomorrow. Hope for tomorrow. I said, I can endure because he said he will. I said, I can endure because he said he will. I said, you can endure because he said he will. Yeah, you can endure. He said he will. Said he will. I know he will. I know he will. Supply. I know he will. I know he will. I know he will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, he said he will. He said he will. He said he will, he said he will, your healing, he said he will, he said he will, your family, he said he will. Yeah. He said he would. And not only did he say it, but he did it. 
as the choir was singing, Reverend Davis, he keeps, Reverend Davis, give me your Bible just for one second. He keeps this as a reminder that God will provide. said he would. You can't see it from where you are seated, but there's a receipt right here. Reverend Davis's Bible dated January, January the 23rd, 1992. And when he needed God to provide, and he went to National Supermarket on Riverview, and the Lord provided him a whole fried chicken for two pennies. Two cents. Two cent chicken. He was starving, hungry. God is still providing for all of his saints. Also, the choir was singing earlier, and I was thinking about the sovereign grace of God, which really leads into our text this morning, coming from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, in the first 15 verses. And I think in order to, um, that we understand this whole miracle, this story, I normally don't read all of the verses, but I think it's uh, necessary in order that uh, we um, clearly see in terms of what Jesus did in this drama. John's Gospel, chapter 5, beginning at verse 1 and stopping at verse 15, first 15 verses. May we all stand as we uh, stand to respect the Word of God. And if you don't have your Bible, it doesn't matter. The um, Scripture is there on the screen. Now I'm going to read it. That's the King James Version. I'm going to be reading out the NIV, the New International Version. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Now the day on which this took place was a Sabbath, and so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? 
The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. So ends the reading of God's blessed word. You may be seated. It was Jesus. And I want to lift this thought uh, for our thinking and our consideration. The man meets the master. The man meets the master. The uh, drama that John depicts here in his gospel, and if you, how many of, let me ask this question, how many of you have ever read the gospel of John all the way through? Okay. And assuming that, that you know the purpose of John's writing, that John, over against all of the other writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, his writing was to prove the deity of Jesus Christ, or to prove that Jesus Christ is God, and that in the flesh God has come down. Like he starts out in chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, what? Was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was in the beginning with God. And he talks about how he made all things. There was nothing that was made without him that was made. In him was light, and the light was the light of men. So he, he, he is proving that this Messiah that Israel is waiting for, or you say you have been waiting for for thousands some years, here he is in the person of Jesus Christ. So here in this fifth chapter, and John does not use but five miracles. I mean, forgive me, seven only uses seven miracles. And here in chapter 5, he points up the third miracle that Jesus performs. He starts back in chapter 2 with the wedding in, in uh, Cana of Galilee, remember? And Jesus turning the water into wine and blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, this is the third miracle. Now, he sets the stage and he says that Jesus is going up to Jerusalem for feast day. John doesn't tell us what feast day it was, and really it's not that important. And he says that as Jesus was going to Jerusalem, then he says by the sheep gate, which uh, uh, from geographically was in the northeastern part of the old city of Jerusalem. And John says that by that uh, gate, or uh, that opening that came through the wall, uh, where sheep were herded through by the farmers, that there was a medical center. And the medical center had five infirmaries. And in these different wards, there were sick folk. And he, uh, he gives a category of some of them. He says some of them were blind, some of them were lame, some of them were infirm, all of them had some kind of disease, or whatever the case might have been. And he says that the reason why these people were there, because, and, and, and uh, I want you to understand, the rest of this that is put in at the latter part of verse 3, where it says that uh, the reason why they were there, an angel came down to stir the water up, and the first person to get in the water would be healed. Well, in older manuscripts, this is not in there. That's deleted. So if I went back to read it, let, let me read you the way the old manuscripts read. It says that there are a number of disabled people used to lie, the blame, the lame, and the paralyzed. And then one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Um, And wait a minute, let me see, I'm trying to find where I'm, what I'm looking for. Get up, okay. Uh, oh yeah, back up to uh, verse 3. And he talks about those that were blind. 
And he talks about the man having been there. In fact, really, in this uh, NS, um, NIV, it does not have that. It leaves it out. It just talks about how long the man had been there. And I really hadn't paid that any attention. And, uh, well, I'll take that back. Verse 7. He said, had nobody to help him into the water when it stirred. Uh, the older, what I'm trying to say is, is the older manuscripts leave that out. And they said that that was an addition that was put in there by the copyist or the one who wrote this in to explain why these sick folk were there at that particular place. And the reason why they were there is because he said an angel came down once a year and stirred the water. Now, we don't know in terms of how he did it. But anyway, after the water was troubled, or bubbling, whichever way you want to uh, uh, describe it, then the first sick person that either rolled in or jumped in or was pushed in the water was healed. So that, that meant what? One person a year. Okay, now, mentally, picture in your mind, here's this medical center. Here are these five wards full of sick people that have been there a long time. Possibly some of them might have been there longer than in, and I use the term because the man is not named here in the miracle. So let's just say number 38. Possibly some of them had been there longer than number 38 had been there. And uh, he was just one of the unfortunate ones that most likely... He had outlived his family or his children, friends, whoever it was. They were possibly somebody he got to carry him every day, to lay him there at the pool. Or he stayed there close morning and night, which meant he lived in the ward. We don't know. John doesn't tell us. But whichever case it was, he was bought there or he stayed there. He couldn't get in the water first to be healed. We understand that, right? And so Jesus comes along. And Jesus, and then, you know, you wonder, well, out of all of these folk that are sick, why would he choose this man? Because others possibly are just as sick, or they might be more sick than this man. Why did Jesus choose this man? So he asked him a very simple question, right? And the question was, do you want to get well? Well, average, common sense person would respond by saying what? One word, yes. Just that simple. He doesn't give a yes. Instead, he responds and replies by telling Jesus why he had not been healed. No, 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 just, just, just listen to his logic and his reasoning. Instead of him wanting to be healed and just saying yes, yes right. Jesus, the reason why I have not been healed is because there's always somebody that gets in ahead of me. So all these other folk here got help. They got wheelchairs. They got, they got uh, uh, orderlies. Everybody to help them, to, to push them and, and ram them into the pool. I ain't got nobody. Well, now, to us, as we read that, that doesn't make sense, does it? Because Jesus didn't ask him that. He didn't ask him why he had not been healed. He just asked him, do you want to get healed? Now, this man is no different from human nature today. We do the same thing. When I say we, I'm talking about humanity. People do the same thing today. God is still in the healing business. But we always want to give excuses and alibis why we couldn't do this, why we couldn't do that. Now, as I get further, I'm going to go into that. Now, here's a man. Jesus says to him, rise. Three things. Rise, take up your mat, and walk. Right? Okay, now, some people would think that in some translations it says bed. We're not talking about the kind of beds that you sleep in there. You know good and well he couldn't take up no iron bed and box springs and all that kind of stuff and then walk with it. In those days, invalids would lay on straw mats 
very thin stuff. Just something, you know, that uh, uh, to help them to, uh, what, sleep better, to feel better. So it wasn't impossible to just pick up that straw mat, flop it over his shoulders, and uh, go on about his business. So that's what he did, right? Okay. Went on about his business, kept on going. So he runs into what? The Jewish leaders. So the first thing, instead of them being happy and glad that this man, and I'm sure that they knew him or they had seen him being that 38 long years, instead of them being happy for him, what's the first thing that they asked him? Why are you carrying your mat on Sunday? That's just as dumb as it can be. Stupid. Not concerned about the man getting well, but they're concerned about tradition. Now, let me say a little bit, because i got to rush through this message, so I'm hoping that you can take all this in at one time. The Pharisees and the scribes did not adhere to the Mosaic law that God gave Moses to the people in the Old Testament in Exodus and Deuteronomy. He only gave them what? Ten laws. We call them the Decalogue, right? Only ten. But then these dudes come along, these smart seminarians and professors and all that kind of stuff, and they add on something like 200 more rules and regulations on to what God had given. The unmitigated goal of these men to try to what? make something better than what God has already done. But again, we know people still do that today. Sin no change, like you've heard me say this before. The only difference between the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve sinned and now, the scenery has changed, the costumes have changed, and the, and the character, no, the, the, the characters have changed. But the plot still remains the same plot. On the day that you do wrong, you shall die. Sin carries a heavy penalty. Okay, let, 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 let me finish this. So the, man, so the man said, well, I really don't know who he was. Because you see, after Jesus had healed him, he slipped away in the crowd. Man didn't know his name. To me, that shows an indifference on his part. And, but later on, we're told by John, Jesus runs into the man at the temple and tells the man one thing. Oh, okay, you're well now. Do not sin no more. In other words, a continuation. Stop sinning implying that this man might have been in that condition because of what that dude did wrong in the past. We don't know, right? And so he goes back, he tells the leaders, it was Jesus that healed me. Now, that goes into another dialogue, but, you know, you got to read the whole fifth chapter, right? Okay, let's come back to the miracle, because this is beautiful. The questions have to be asked, why did Christ, why did he choose this unattractive character to heal. Among all of these sick people, John doesn't tell us, but based upon God's character, we know that it was his sovereign grace. Amen? Amen. Now, before I get into the brief heart of this miracle, let me briefly restate this phrase that is repeated often. And that phrase is sovereign grace. How many of you have ever heard that term? Sovereign grace. Sovereign grace. Raise your hand if you've heard that term. Sovereign grace. Do you really know what it means? Okay. Let me tell you what it means. When we talk about sovereign grace, open, in, open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 42 verse 8 then chapter 43 verse 10 chapter 46 <laughs> verse 9 and 10 so you get three chapters you get chapter 42 43 and 46 in isaiah and we're going to let god tell us 
what his sovereign sovereignty is. We're going to let it come out of his own mouth. In Isaiah, the 42nd chapter and the 8th verse is defined like this. God says, I am the Lord. That's my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. Then in the 43rd chapter of Isaiah, verse 10, B part, God says, Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. Amen? And then coming down to verse 13, he says, Apart from me there is no Savior. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? In other words, when I do something, nobody else can stop it or retard it or turn it around. When I say it, it shall be done. And I'm quoting this out of the uh, NIV translation. Then also in the 46th chapter of Isaiah, verse 9, 10, and 11b, in the part of verse 10, he says, My purpose will stand. And I will do all that I please. This is God talking. And what I have planned, that will I do. Amen? You can't stop God. You can curse him out. You can get angry with him. You can, you can shake your fist at him. But when God gets ready to what? Perform a purpose, it doesn't matter. You know, that's the same thing as your, your children when they were small and you told them to do something and they got angry and didn't want to do it and they might have looked at you with a frown or some of them might have been so rebellious they might have done like that. That didn't bother you, did it? Because all you had to do was just bop them side the head. They had no power to make you change your decision. Or if you told them to sit down, it didn't matter. Well, just like a parent has that kind of authority and control, think about God that has all power. Amen. Amen. Now, let's take the word grace. We've looked at sovereignty, right? Sovereignty means God can do anytime, do anything anytime he chooses with anybody for any purpose that he chooses to do. The time and the place is up to him. Now, the word grace. And to define the word grace, I want to go to Max Licato in his book, Grace, where he gives a beautiful description and definition of grace. And I quote Max Licato. The meaning of life, the wasted years of life, the poor choices of life, God answers the mess of life with one word, grace. We talk as though we understand the term. The bank gives us a grace period. The bad uh, politicians fall from grace. Musicians speak of a grace note. We describe an actress as being gracious, a dancer as being grateful. We use the word for hospitals, babies, girls, kings, and we even say grace before we eat our meals, amen? We talk as though we know what grace really means, especially at church. Amen. Grace. Grace is the songs that we sing and the Bible verses we read. Preachers explain it. Hymns proclaim it. Seminaries teach it. But do we really understand the word grace? When grace happens, we receive not a nice compliment from God, but we receive a new heart from God. Amen? Amen? amen. amen. You ought to say amen on that. Amen. Grace is not something that's nice to talk about. Grace is really a hard operation and a hard transplant that God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, performs in the hearts of each of us. In other words, we are saved, uh, what? By his power, by his grace. He chose us. We didn't choose him. In fact, we didn't even know about him. 
And when we were enjoying ourselves and our sins and our pleasures, we didn't care nothing about God, but it was God that met us where we didn't know he was going to meet us. Take the example of the prodigal son. He let the prodigal son go ahead and just waste everything. And he waited until the prodigal son, what, got down as low as he could sink in a hog pen, stinking, smelling, feeding pigs. Then what? He hit his mind and his heart. And the young man said, I need to go back home. Amen. Paul, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, says, It is no longer I who live. But what, Verdi, Christ that lives in me. Now, let's examine this text more thoroughly now that we have defined the word sovereignty and grace. Jesus had the power in this miracle, if he had chosen, to clean out the entire pool area by speaking what? Just one word. Everybody would have been healed. Not a single invalid could have survived the power of God. But he healed only one man. This veteran Bethsaida uh, 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 pool invalid. To prove what? His divine grace. The length and the extent of the man's illness didn't present no problem for Jesus. For surely the longer a person is sick, the less likely that he or she will get well. On the flip side of that coin, spiritually, the longer a person has lived in sin, the less likely that that person will come to Christ. And that's the reason why parents try to lead their children when they are young to Jesus. Because the older you get, you become what? Stubborn, proud, fixed in your own direction of life. You want what you want. You become selfish and greedy because you're looking at things in the world, what your friends tell you that they got. So what? You want the same thing. And as you get older and older and older, you become what? Harder and harder and harder. Which means that the hammer of God's grace has to hit you hard when you get old. He has to break up a whole lot of concrete in your heart when you get old. But when you're young, you're not pli you, you are more pliable. You, you, your personality has not been structured and set like concrete. And you're more open to listen, to reflect, and to accept the grace of God. But what is humanly impossible with us? God loves to do. God does not need stirring pools or magic to work his power in our lives. God does not need anyone to help him. We don't need to wear crosses around our necks. Or we don't need a saintly figurine on the dashboard of your car. You don't need to pour oil on your head for healing. Amen. Sometimes God just wants us to ask, as the centurion soldier did. And sometimes he asks for faith before he acts. But God does not need our help. He doesn't need our permission or even our faith when he chooses to work in our lives or in the lives of our loved ones. Amen? That was a lady when we were in Chattanooga. Her name was Mrs. Myrtle Cummins. And the Lord has carried her home now. But I remember this was back about 30 years ago. She uh, had several bouts with cancer. And, uh, and God, by his mercy, he would bring her to the point that she would get stronger and get better. The cancer would regress for a while, then it would come back again and over and over again. But I'll never forget, there was one time that the cancer came back and had carried her to the, maybe the inch of the doorstep of death. Family called me up. And I got there that night, and I never will forget the time. It was close to 9 o'clock. I walked down the corridor. When I went into her room, 
they had her on uh, oxygen and they had then they had a tent over her and uh, there was a doctor there in her room and I told him who I was and I asked him about her prognosis and the doctor said well she possibly won't make it to see morning that this is about it and uh, I walked there and I walked up to her bedside and I looked at her and I thought about and she was a very sweet lady she sang in the choir she was always helping other people she never did have any children of her own and I thought about how she had given her service to the Lord and I never had this to happen before and it's never happened with me since then but as I was standing there looking at that body at the doorway of death the Holy Spirit prompted me to just say one prayer for her and that prayer was Lord extend her life do not let her die and I turned around and walked out of that room and whether you believe this or not God had given me the assurance that Sister Cummins was not going to die that night I didn't think about it anymore I left it in God's hands that morning around about 10 o'clock somebody in the family called me up and uh, they said whatever God did she was sitting up in her bed eating breakfast and smiling now that doesn't happen all the time doesn't happen all the time. No, 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 no. Now, why God chose to do that for her at that particular time, I don't know. That's in the sovereign will of God. And he extended her life, I think, about eight or nine or ten more years. But for whatever reason, he wanted her to be around, maybe to touch some, somebody else's life. But you see, in, in embracing the will of God, you got to understand, God doesn't heal when we want him to heal. He doesn't heal every disease. He doesn't heal every illness. And don't get mad with it when you pray for healing and God does not do it. The better prayer to pray is, Lord, like Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, in the flesh I will this. Always in the flesh. We want to live. We want the flesh to be healed so we can go on a few more years. Even though God has told us from dust to heart to dust return, we still want to hang around here as long as we can. Right. And ain't no use of nobody laughing or smiling. You know you do. Right. But we got to say that my life is in the hands of God. If he chooses me to live out so many years, fine. If he doesn't, the more important thing is, while I have these few days, months, and years to live, am I living for his glory or for my own selfish output? Am I what? Touching the life of other people? Do other people see Christ in me and through me? That's more important. Am I living for him? not for me and when I live for him whether it's what 20 30 years 40 years 80 900 time doesn't mean a thing because when you get through you're going back down amen and the most important thing is when I die have I lived a life that Christ would be honored and our other lives were they impacted by Jesus Christ through me and were they pointed to the master for his glory that's the only thing that matters the rest of it can control it now briefly there are some lessons to be gathered and garnished from this miracle and I want to share four of them with you and we're through. Lesson number one, we are never too sick. We are never too lost. We're never too sinful for God's power. You're never too sick. You're never too lost. 
and you're never too sinful for God's power. Let's say it another way. Jesus saves to the utmost. Do you know what the word utmost means? You can't go past utmost. Utmost goes eternally. Yeah, utmost goes eternally. That's the reason why you can't, if you're praying for loved ones in your family, or praying for those distant relatives, or might be somebody on your job, whatever it is, for their salvation, don't ever give up praying for them. Now, you're going to get weary physically. The flesh gets tired. And you're going to feel as though that your prayers are in vain because you may not see any visible signs of it. But be what? Be ever vigilant. Be ever faithful. Keep praying. Now, you've heard me say this time and time again. It may not be God's will for you in your praying to see the result of your prayer. It may not be in his will. It might be after you are gone, somebody else will see that. Remember Paul made a statement one time. He said that uh, I planted somebody else what? Paul didn't get a chance to do it in the water, did he? And he didn't get a chance to see God bring forth the harvest, the increase. God gives the increase. You see, because of sin, we're so greedy, we want to plant, water, and see the harvest. We want the whole ball of wax. <laughs> yeah, we, we want it right now, you know. We, we, we want to put the pork chop in the oven. We want the pork chop cooked now. And then we want to take the pork chop out of the oven and eat some of the pork chop now. But go, well, all right, you, you, you get my point. I read the other day where he was talking about there were a lot of people that were interviewed and they were asked a question. Do you think that you're going to heaven? And uh, many of them gave this mystical thing about St. Peter having a scale an eternal scale, and that all of their good was put on one side, all the bad was put on the other side, and if enough good was put on one side just to tip the scale from the bad, then St. Peter would come to the gate and open it and let them go in. And then they were asked, what constitute the good things? And this was their response. Well, I'm a good person. I get along with my neighbors. I'm a good, loving parent. I take care of my family. I'm involved in civic activities. I'm a member of a church. I've been baptized. So therefore, that qualifies me to get into heaven. You're getting mighty quiet. That doesn't qualify any of us to get to heaven. Do you know what qualifies us to get to heaven? Accepting Jesus Christ by faith. And believing that he died on the cross for your sins. And he was resurrected to justify you before his father and he bore your sins in his body on that cross and if you accept that by faith that's what gets you into heaven the rest of this what you do that's by works and if we could work our way to heaven then don't you think that Jesus Christ died for nothing he suffered for nothing if we could work our way to heaven Amen. Amen. Number two. When God chooses to act, he can do so independent of any other source, even including us. Now this is where his sovereign grace comes in to save. 
Notice that the man, number 38 there at the pool, gratefully accepted the gift that Christ offered him to be healed, but he ignored the giver. Because when they asked him, who healed you, he didn't even know Jesus' name. That's sad. You remember the incident that's recorded, I think, in Mark, where there were ten lepers that came to Jesus to be healed, and, uh, and he healed all of them, and all of them left, and one remembered to come back to say, thank you. One out of ten, which meant the other nine felt as though that they, what? That that was, that was uh, what should have been done in their life. They were entitled to that. Sometimes in the church we can, we can engraft an attitude of entitlement and feel as though because we've been in the church so long, we've done so much that God entitles us. But let me tell you something, Pleasant Green, and you hear me well this morning. If it's possible to be in a church for 100 years and to lay the concrete for every brick and wall for the wall, and you half build the church, and you do great service there in the church, but don't know Jesus Christ. You will die and go to hell in your sins. God doesn't need buildings. <clears throat> Hear me this morning. He doesn't need a building to save a soul. Builders don't make people. People make buildings. God is concerned about the soul of man. Not where man is. And he came to die for souls. Amen? Number three. In John's gospel, miracles are not produced by faith, but miracles produce faith. Miracles are not produced by faith, but miracles do produce faith in John's gospel. It's possible to experience an exciting miracle in your life. And when we talk about miracles and healing, it doesn't, it, it, it's, it's not primarily isolated to physical healing because in our society now with all the stress and with all of the pressures, people need mental healing with bipolarism and distorted personalities. People need mental healing. They need emotional healing. There's so many types of healing that folk need today. So it's not just physical healing, but you can experience a healing by God and still not be saved and go to heaven. You can accept it and then go on your merry way. Continue in the lifestyle that you are living. But remember this, after man dies, once the judgment. You got to face God. If you don't face him on this side, you're going to face him on the other side. You, uh, uh, let me say the way that the, that the kids say it. You can't get around him. He's so low you can't go over under him. So high you can't go over him. He's so wide you can't go around him. You got to come what? Through the door. And then fourth and finally, open eyes and an open heart can produce an open mind. It's a tragedy to be healed by heaven and then sin against heaven. You can't make it to heaven with a work salvation ethic. God will not permit it. 
You have to surrender your will. You have to surrender your plans. And that's the hardest thing for the ego of man to do. Turn or lose my plans and what I have already figured out, what I want to do, and give it over to him, and then let him remap and replan my life. I think he has given me wisdom and insight. I think that I can do a little bit. Why does he have to take over? Well, let me tell you why he has to take over. First of all, because he made you. And without him sustaining your physical life, you wouldn't be here. Secondly, he made all of us for a purpose, a reason. Like I heard in the song the other day, none of us was made to enjoy a life of pleasure. God didn't put us here for that. Not to have fun. He made us in order that we glorify him. That's what he says in his word. We are down here, what? For one reason only, to shine the spotlight on him. Ye are the what? The light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. The, the, the world has lost its taste. So you got to season it. Season it with the spirit and the love of Christ. The world is in darkness. You got to show the world some light. They're groping around in dark. You remember the incident where Abraham had prayed for Lot, his nephew, that God would not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> and excuse me, the angels went down there and heard, uh, accepted Abraham's prayer, went down there to rescue Lot and all of his family from Sodom and Gomorrah. And as the heavenly angels were going to the home of Lot, you remember that. Can, 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 can I say it, preachers? Yeah. Is it all right? You don't think that they will be offended, do you? Is that the word? Oh, okay. Rev. Reverend Harden said that I could say this. He was surrounded with homosexuals, with deviants, with people that wanted, wanted them to become like them. And they tried to seduce Lot to become like them. And if it had not been for God rescuing Lot, and go, you know what happened to his wife, don't you? She was so locked in to the pleasures of Sodom and Gomorrah, and she was walking like this. Lord said, it don't look bad. She couldn't resist it. And I can't imagine. She just had to get that last glance. And when her eyes hit that sin, you know what happened. She didn't look no more. Mm -mm, she didn't look no more. The world will destroy you. And those of us who have been rescued from the world, we know what the world did to us. And some of you all are vibrant witnesses here this morning you know the world can whip you can lacerate you they can down you they can use you up spit you out walk away from you laugh at you and even kick you and leave you to die by yourself but Jesus he loves you how does that song go Jesus loves me this. Why? Little ones, they are weak. Yes. Yes. How do you know he loves you? For the Bible, his word tells me so. The man met the master. And when you meet Jesus, you're going to change. I guarantee you, you're going to change. And he starts on the inside. And it, what? Bursts and explodes to the outside. Jesus 
Sharon played it, paid it all. All to him, everything I owe. From my inward healing, from my mind, giving me his peace, giving me, putting his joy in my heart, like David said in Psalm 51, restore unto me the joy of your salvation, because this world can also suck your, the joy out of you and can leave you dry and barren and hopeless and helpless on the inside. So David said, after he had committed his sin with Bathsheba, Lord, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. In other words, I want to feel again the way that I felt when you and I first start what? Start walking together. Has anybody here this morning, have you ever had your jaw to get low? Any of y'all ever had your jaw to get low? Have you ever driven your car and you watch the gauge on your car, you know, your, your tank, and, and, and maybe, maybe that needle is on half full, and you say to yourself, well, I can make it maybe for a couple of more days. But then something intervenes and causes you to be able to drive some extra miles you hadn't counted on. And then when you look over, that needle is over there and it's getting close to that little red dot. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and you tell yourself, I better pull into this filling station. Now, you might have had your favorite filling station where the prices were lower than, quick, than QT was, but you're at the port now, and maybe you're getting ready to drive or maybe across town, and you know what's left in your tank ain't going to carry you over there. So you got to stop at a high price service station to buy gas that you normally wouldn't stop at. Help me, Jesus Christ. You know what I'm talking about. So what you, what, you, what you did, you put in maybe five or ten dollars, which at gas prices a day is nothing. Ten dollars might get you what about uh, what four or five? No, not even five gallons. Maybe about three or four gallons at the max. So you figure, well, it'll be enough to get me to my favorite film station where the price is about a couple of pennies lower. Then I'll fill it up. Joy can get just like that tank. And nobody wants your joy low. But the other day, the other day, when I went into Sam's, and Sam's is about the lowest in terms of gas prices in town. Amen? And I'm advertising for Sam. If you get low on gas, go to Sam. If QT says maybe 249, Sam's will be at least about 240, 239. But anyway, anyway, I went in there, and the car seemed to have been driving Flynn a little bit sluggish. <laughs> So instead of putting in regular, I decided I'm going to put in mid-grade. I'm going to fill it up. And I filled up my tank with mid-grade, y'all. And when I filled it up with mid-grade, I wanted to see in terms of would it perform better? Would it have more kick? Would it have more zest? More power? And so when I left, when I left Sam and I got on the freeway, some said, try it out now. <laughs> and I floored that accelerator and John, that car kicked like a mule. And the next thing I knew, my head was going back and I said, whoa, this boy's got some power now. And I just slowly let my foot off the accelerator and let it slow down. Now, the reason why I put in that mid-grade is because I wanted to clean out the motor, the pistons, the intake, where carbon had built up. Y'all ain't following me. You act like I'm talking Greek to you. Every now and then in our hearts and in our souls, the carbon of sin builds up. 
And it can clog your thinking, your emotions. It can come between you and a loved one. It can stop you from really being a, 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 a brother or sister to another brother or sister within the family. And every so often you got to ask God, clean out your tank, clean out your motor. And you know, you don't put in mid-grade gasoline to clean out this motor. The only way you clean this mode out, you have to go down on your knees in prayer. And ask God to give you what? A clean heart. A right spirit. And now. And restore unto you the joy of his salvation. Not my salvation. I didn't save myself. I can't save myself. But the joy of his salvation. There might be somebody here this morning that your heart, your mind, and your soul are somewhat clogged from all the debris in this world today and it's a whole lot of junk and stuff that's floating around and you have to guard your soul unethical practices sexualities lying cheating murders you name it you can the list just goes on and on and on and on and, 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 and there's no use of pretending that as a Christian, you're not affected by it. No, no. You're lying. You're affected by it because you're human. You hear it. You see it. And there is a response in your heart to it. You see a mother kill three of her children. Or burn a baby. You can't help but respond to heinous crimes like this, to sinful deeds like this. But one thing that we know, we don't know how God is going to work through all of the evil and the chaos of this world, but we do know one thing. He said, now notice, notice here, he said, that's all you got to go on. He said, and what he's already done. What he's done, what he says. His character, his reputation is authentic. He stands by himself. He said. That's all you got. Somebody might say, well, that ain't enough. Well, the song says, if I got Jesus, I got enough. But it's your decision. You can keep on flirting and dancing in the world's delight until it's too late. And one thing about being saved, you can't wait until a fraction of a second before 12 midnight. No, no. And salvation doesn't come on the other side of the grave. No, no. Salvation comes now where you must make the decision whether I will accept Jesus Christ. The kingdom, his kingdom, the doors were flung open when he hung their own cavalry and shed his blood. And when he said in the sixth chapter of John, if I be lifted up, I will draw what? All men unto me. And he still has the same drawing power right now. Will you trust him? Will you yield to him? Will you surrender to him? If you're here, and it doesn't matter about whether your name is on the roll of a church. But if you don't know Jesus, a piece of paper does not give you eternal life. You've got to know Jesus Christ personally 
for yourself. May we all stand. If you're here, will you come? For the Bible tells me so. I have his authentic word. Jesus loves me. This I know. For his word, the Bible, tells me so. Little ones, we're weak, but he's strong. Therefore, yes, Jesus loves me. I know he loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, he loves me. For he told me so. One more time, that chorus. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. And all of the saints of the Most High God said together, Amen and Amen. associate ministers, to the official staff, and to all of my father's children, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is Brother Alvin Taylor in the uh, congregation today? Will, Ms. Taylor, would you this please stand on his behalf? We have a uh, congratulations for him. <laughs> On March the 20th, 2015, Alvin was, um, he was inducted into the Federal Reserve Law Enforcement Officers. And I, I assume that's a pretty hefty promotion. Okay, so he's with the Federal Reserve, and we want to congratulate him on behalf of the church. And may I pick it back on that? I was blessed to have been invited to that ceremony that happened this past Friday at the um, Reserve Bank. And there were nine candidates that uh, were uh, there for graduation. They were presented their badges and their shields and they took the oath of office. And it was a beautiful affair, really was, yeah. Amen, amen. Monday, March 23rd through Thursday, March 25th, the Antioch, Antioch District Leadership classes will begin. They'll be at 6.30. They will be held at Hopewell Missionary Baptist Church. It's in 917 North Taylor Avenue. The cost of registration is $10. Good Friday service for Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church will be Friday, April 3rd, 2015, from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. The theme will be Seven Last Words, and the, messenger, the messengers will be the associate ministers of Pleasant Green. Okay, thank you. 
Also, Good Friday Crucifixion service will be held at Christ Southern Mission Baptist Church, 5630 Page Boulevard. That's also going to be April 3rd at 9 a.m. in the morning. The messenger will be Reverend J.B. Garris. He's the pastor of Jerusalem Missionary Baptist Church. A night to celebrate gospel choirs. Sunday, March 29th, 6 p.m., the Fifi Baptist Church, 1133 St. Charles Rock Road, will be featuring members of the members and friends of the Fifi Baptist Church, what is his first St. Louis Metropolitan Police Choir, Coca Singers, and the Trinity Community Church Singers. And they will be